It is just a huge honor to be with the most requested podcast, the biggest legend on Dental Town, Lane Ochi. You pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's an honor to meet you. You, um, I mean, I can't. Dental Town was twenty years old mm. this last week, nineteen ninety nine, and um, you're you're the number one authority on. On nothing, on nothing actually on nothing. How, how did you how did you gain that respect what, what do you you know um I, I think we need to step back a little bit to how i came to dental town and i don't know if you've ever seen me write about this but it's kind of interesting i got a copy of dental town magazine and i read something that i so disagreed with that i had to log on to dental town to say i don't believe this and all of a sudden i started engaging with just incredibly passionate human beings just dentists who really wanted to learn wanted to hear different sides of the story and you know what i'll tell you one thing you are looking at the ultimate beneficiary of mentorship and what dental town offered me was an opportunity to return mentorship to people who wanted like me to learn so that's how i got there and that's why you have me well, it, it was such, it was so different because I'm sure millennials don't realize that it used to be all the magazines and newspapers just came at you and you, you couldn't return the ball. Right. And that was what was so cool about Dental Town is you could say something to a magazine and a guy like you can log on and say, no, I, I, I disagree completely. That That's really the magic, that it's interactive. Absolutely. And, and you know what's really interesting? Um, I, I've heard about the Wild West days and I've, I've gone back being a, an occlusion junkie and looked at some of those interactions. And, and while engaging and knowledgeable weren't very favorable to, again, bring the outside people in to join the party, to join the conversation. So, you know, kudos to the whole process of making this community where everyone's welcome, not not just to listen, but to say, ask a question. Uh, boy, this may not seem like I know what I'm talking about, but can I ask it anyways? And people don't have any fear. And to me, that's just wonderful. I mean, you just can't ask for better interaction than that. So what he's talking about is, um what was my biggest mistake on that dental town is being a libertarian i just don't like regulation i mean when you grew up in kansas if you want to plant wheat or soybean i don't know why you need a department of agriculture like we don't have a department of cell phones everybody's staring at their cell phones right. so why do you have a department of agriculture so i was a libertarian and just said free for all because i didn't understand what social bullying was what toxic people are what trolls are mm -hmm. i thought it would self-police and it took me a long time to realize there's just really toxic negative hateful people so that was when we brought in hogo mm -hmm. and we brought in howard goldstein and we just said um and, and people were just shocked they're like you can't ban me i have ten thousand posts you're an asshole <laughs> and I'm and we're banning you because it because and then people would say well I have freedom of speech no the constitution is between you and the government mm -hmm. you don't have free speech in my house you right. come to my house I yeah. can shoot you're, you you're my guest please yeah, respect yeah. my, my so rules so all we yes, all yeah. we ask is that we're mm -hmm. at a party it's private property it's my house just be nice <laughs> how hard is it to be nice right. and and again if, if you want to learn something if you want to engage then you know you have to play nice I, I, look uh, I've engaged in and had to actually, I actually gave myself a couple timeouts over the time I've been in dental town because I just got sucked into this vortex of negative people and negativity and I just hated myself for doing that. And so, you know, it's just, it's kind of fun to, to work in the internet, right? Like you were describing. To me, I treat dental town like a case presentation, resident case presentation. You know, look, you get to you get to say what you're thinking you get to show me your, what you want to do you present your rationale and then people go around the room and and either agree or disagree and it's a learning experience to share that amount of knowledge disagree or not agree and come away with everyone going you know what i have a couple of other options i didn't consider or as i always say howard look the hardest part and the most important part of being an educator is knowing when to take off that educator cap and putting on your student cap. And that's why I love Dental Town. Now, I know you're shy and humble, but tell these people who you are. No. Tell, you don't want to tell me your resume? <laughs> no, I do not. It, I, it, you're, this, this is an amazing man. So, what, um, 
I'll, so, tell you, I'll tell you what 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 the what are the proudest things just you, you, you we talked about social media right my daughter's a social media expert and she goes dad why don't you have a website i go what honey what do i need a website for well, don't you want to be busier i go uh no not really but she but she goes well you don't understand you know how important you know connections are in social media what influencers are and the funniest thing happened and and i consider this one of my greatest honors of recent that you and i are both in the same book the titans of dentistry yes and, and i thought this is really cool because i consider myself uh, Mr. Magoo, I'm a dinosaur. I'm an analog guy in a digital world. So it's so exciting, you know, to be part of interactions and teaching, you know, that is so broad based, that is involving social media. You know, it just feels good to be, I guess, relevant again, you know, and and, and that's what I'm really digging. That's what I really started digging dental town. And it's nice because it stays so damn focused. I mean, there are plenty of dental Facebook groups out there. Um, I'm the moderator of a couple of them. And the interactions can just kind of go so far off the trail that there's no way to bring it back. And so this is the beauty of having a family. And I dig it. I really love it. So what, what do you think um, dentists um, have the hardest time learning? Like, I want to start with uh, collusion. When, whenever... I talk to young people that are still in dental school or just come out. They, you know, they they always tell me they don't see a lot of controversy in endo. The pediatric dentist, the only thing they really argue about is silver diamine fluoride. But they're, they're, she's got three hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, and she doesn't know if she should learn neurolingual muscular occlusion or Panky Dawson. Why is it? Why is um? A, why are there different camps in occlusion, and what guidance would you give her to pick one direction or another? Well, well, the problem is with occlusion confusion. Is <laughs> occlusion confusion? Yeah, uh, it, it is. Uh, it's I'm actually going to be talking about this tomorrow. I, I have a favorite saying from one of my pre-doctorate uh, dental students: occlusion is the science of useless gestures for pretended accuracies. And it goes, <laughs> right? You have to repeat that. <laughs> and, and, is, occlusion is the science of useless gestures for pretended accuracies. Now, here's the problem, right? It's the problem is our educational system. When do we learn occlusion? We are first year, second semester, right? Preclinical doctors. By the time we hit clinic, by the time we actually have to make a restoration or carve an occlusal, you know, uh, direct restoration, you know, all that, all that got pushed out of our heads and fell out, and, and we had to replace it with something else. And so we're so busy trying to learn for the moment. We're so busy trying to, you know, earn our credits. We're so busy trying to just get out that we never have time to revisit what we learned. And you know, if you look at the underlying message. In, in, in my DT lectures, both of them, is that there is tr a continuity that we have to keep coming back on what we've learned and apply it to what we are trying to learn more about. And so when it comes to occlusion, there is no right or wrong answer, okay? Like all, like this, that pesky little bell curve, that Gaussian distribution, all of us are different and that makes, you know, makes it wonderful. Thank God there's physiologic tolerance. Can you imagine if everybody was occlusally aware? We, we'd never walk out of the room, right, Howard? We, we wouldn't. So my, my comment to anyone who wants to learn occlusion is learn as much from as many schools as you can because not every shoe fits, okay? There's nothing really wrong. But that said, there are some really basic rules. And guess what I'm gonna be talking about tomorrow? The basic the rules? The basic rules, because they're real simple. Can you, cover, can you tell us what they are now? Well, in a nutshell, there's two traditional types of treatment planning, right? When you and I went to school, it was all about learning things about the joint and treatment planning from the joint forward. You know, today cosmetics drives the train, doesn't it, right? So all treatment planning today is from the front backwards. And the reality is that we have to treatment plan from both, both forward and backwards. There's some anatomical information that the jaw joints give us that we can apply to how the front teeth look, how long they are, and whether they're gonna run into each other and hurt themselves. So basically, it's just a melding of understanding what's here and how this 
has to be in harmony with this. So we talk about occlusal design. It's nothing more than occlusal harmony. The front has to be in harmony with the back. That's all there is to it. This whole concept of envelope of function, I have no idea what that means. I think it's a made up term. And so it complicated occlusion tremendously, just like centric relation, complicated terms, you know, complicated occlusion tremendously. No, it's much simpler than that. What terms do you like? How about if I were king of the world to call it a position of orthopedic stability? Just, it's that simple. It's not a position we force people into. It's not a position that we electrocute their muscles with to find. It is a place that they can comfortably function to and from. That's it, harmonious. So when you go to any dental laboratory, probably 95% of the crowns are coming in one tooth at a time, which usually a six year molar. When does someone have to step up their occlusion game um, and go to uh, full mouth impressions and a bite or an articulator? Or- wow, did you write my lecture for tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it's, it's really, um, you know, 99% of our work is going to be done in MIP. The patients, just the way they, they present to us, right? And MIP is? Is maximum intercuspal position. So the question is, is when don't we use MIP? And that's when it's unhealthy, it's not reliable or stable, or are you going to alter the vertical dimension of occlusion? You know, those are pretty, you know, pretty broken down dentitions when you get to that point, right? So when you want to advance into more sophisticated occlusal concepts to do more sophisticated dentistry, that's when you have to start learning more and more about occlusion. Just an observation, and of course this is a simple generalization, right? What's the problem with being an old dentist? Our patients have gotten old with us, haven't they? Now we're seeing worn dentitions, mutilated dentitions. So I don't think the younger dentist is going to see as many older patients. That's chip, typically how it doesn't work, right? It, it works with our demographics follow us within 10 years of our own age. So for a new practitioner, occlusion really is not a big deal to learn. The only thing you need to know about occlusion as a young doctor is when to refer her. Okay. As you become a more middle-aged, a more experienced doctor, and you start seeing, wait a minute, I'm seeing wear and breakdown in my cases, in my patients. Things don't last as long as I thought they would. That's when you start learning. When I, you know, uh, I used to run just private workshops, and I found, interestingly enough, the demographics was the 50-year-old dentist, you know, the guy who loves our profession, loves doing dentistry and helping people, but it took him you know, half a lifetime of observation to see, hey, I need to know something else because something else, something is missing. So I guess if to go all the way full circle back to your question, you know, when do people need to start really learning occlusion? I would say be aware of it in the early part of your professional journey, but make sure you put it on the shelf in the middle part of your journey because the back end, the final part of your journey is going to be so much more rewarding. Why do you and I have gold and why has the market all gone to zirconium and do you think that's a, a big deal? Well, it's 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 kind of our own doing, unfortunately, right? Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me let me explain it this way. So, so in Beverly Hills, is that where you practice? I practice in Beverly Hills. Ground zero for aesthetic Nine, dentistry. 90210? 902, yeah, 11. 90211, that's yeah. the movie theater. Yeah. No, no, the, the, the 90210 is the, is the show. So I, I'm, same zip code. So, oh, go ahead. So, so <laughs> basically, uh, 50% of my single tooth operative is still gold. I still do gold uh, in my patients. No, I'm a doctor's doctor. You know, I, I treat a lot of our colleagues, none of them offer gold in their own practices. You know, they're perfectly capable of it. They just don't want to be bothered explaining to patients the pros and cons. But guess what they want me to put in their mouth? No. Gold. And you know, when patients ask me, well, what would it show? And I go, have you no- ever noticed my gold crowns? And I've got, you know, two full gold crowns on my lower first molars, on my lower s- sixes. I mean, come on. It shows if you look for it, but most people aren't looking for it. And, and I tell them the story about other dentists. And they go, well, well, why do dentists want to put gold in their mouth? They go, guess what? We don't like sitting in that chair any more than you do. So what we do is we put in, in our mouths the thing that lasts the longest. 
what would you like me to put in your mouth? Thing that lasts the longest. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. All gold. All gold. Yep. It works really well. Now that said, let's face it: the evolution of our of, of our profession with the simultaneous evolution of the lab has changed. You know, the small lab is gone. The individual single single lab technician, what my father was, is gone. Your father was that? My my father, my father. I am I am I'm on, on the dental radar blip. I mean, I'm I'm like uh, I'm a I'm a valley. My father was one of the the premier laboratory technicians in the world at the time. He helped Peter K. Thomas teach his waxing courses around the world. So that's that was my end to dentistry. And Peter, uh, where did Peter K. Thomas live? Was he? He's Be no, no, Beverly Hills also. He was Beverly Hills. Yes, Beverly Hills also. Wow. So that's that's my end to dentistry. And so what's happened? And oh, okay. So so of all things, in let's see, nineteen in this nineteen late seventies. Uh, there was a dental technology school, and again, just as the wave is going, that dental technology schools are disappearing because handcrafted restorations are disappearing. But at the time, there was a very good dental school at um, Orange, Orange County University, Orange Coast University, and there were two uh, lab techs on the board. One of them was my father. The other one was Jim Glidewell. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and so, my dad always thought. Is your father still alive? No, he passed. He he passed. But he how always. Old, how old would he be now? Oh, geez. Uh, Jim's about what seventy something. Yeah, he. My dad would be in his eighties, early eighties. Okay, so he's a little so ten years older than Jim. Yeah, yeah. So so, anyways, you know, my dad goes, ah, uh, you know, his work isn't as good as mine, but I got a funny feeling he's going to do better than I will, <laughs> and and so. As the as the market changed, you know, as our reimbursements changed, and this is why, you know, becoming a fee for service dentist is critical. You know that, that you you have to do this because if you're going to be stuck with the whims of what you're going to be compensated, you have to find lower cost alternatives. And unfortunately, what filled the niche of the lower cost alternative, something not made by you and me by hand, something that was made by a machine where the, t the skill of the technician is simply, can you play Nintendo and program a computer? So we've kind of screwed ourselves because we weren't careful and we weren't seeing the big picture. And now the price to be paid with these restorations is we have restorations that while they cost less, they're easier to manufacture, don't last as long for a number of reasons. The zirconium? Zirconia. Okay, so Glidewell's doing 12,000 cases a day. Yeah. Um, why, but circling around the question, do you think the zirconium does is not lasting as long as the gold? No. Okay, but explain that why. Well, the problem because a lot of yeah. lot of the young kids are going to say, "No, no, no, it's harder than gold." Well, the problem it's the hardest yeah. substance ever. Yeah, but see, that's just one one part of the whole picture, right? So, at the end of the day, we have to understand something about zirconia. Okay, it's made with subtractive milling, okay? so we're taking away, we're carving the internal, the intaglio of a piece of material to get it to fit as intimately as possible to the tooth. Now, it's not just the fit, it's how well you adapt to the internal features as well as how well you manage the thickness of the looting agent. Everything interacts with everything else, all right? Nothing to date it's better than wax and cast metal on the internal of the crown where it's the most important that the cement not fail there. Now, marginal fit, almost identical between subtractive milled and waxed and cast, but internal fit, still a significant difference. And I actually, again, I'm going to speak to that in great detail as well, because your your question is the question I get the most from younger doctors. Why do we have to be so anal about all the details? It's just a crown for my you know for goodness gracious. Well, yeah, it's just a crown, but what happens when it fails? What happens if it gets secondary decay? You know what? I don't enjoy cutting those things off. I don't know about you, but I just don't enjoy doing it. 
and yet we're having to take away more and replace more and more of them because of decay yet how long have they actually been on the market howard right 2008 glidewell was making zero zirconia crowns here we are just barely a decade later why are we replacing so many of these things there's a problem, isn't there? And what do you think the problem is? Well, again, I think it's this, it's just the manufacturing methodology because yeah. it's milled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I what what blows my mind away is how girls resist gold dentistry, but they have it on their ears or nose or belly button or mm -hmm. ankle. You know, why why is it that gold is the coolest thing anywhere on their entire body but their teeth right you know it's a it's a question i always ask and i you know when when i have the those really stubborn ones that just nope no gold i go but 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 yes i know it's here it's here it's here it's here i just don't want it now this this is this may just be a demographic thing right in beverly hills they all have they all grew up with nannies and housekeepers from third world countries that have open open face gold crowns on their anterior teeth so it may be just you know Status. in my yeah my unique my unique you know ge uh, geography that it's just not it's not associated with you know the US well, I, have to, I have to make a confession on on the tape that at least at least once every 5 years you know, she refused gold. It's a second molar. The prep was so short. I'm looking at the deal. The lab answer is not enough for him. And I just say, just do it gold. Mm -hmm. She'll never know. And no one's, I've never, I, I've done that at least every five years for 30 years. And not one woman ever came back to me and said, hey, you put gold, but it's, it's a max 30 second molar. Right, right. It's only me and your ENT are ever going to see right. this thing. And, no and, one else and is and if, and if on, on the upper. Yeah, if anyone's looking that close, man, it doesn't matter, right? They're, 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 they're into your personal life way yeah. further. That I have to, if it, you know, this is a deal I make with patients, right? If they're on the, pardon the pun, if they're on the cusp, okay, look, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what I'll no do. No pun intended. No pun intended. All puns intended. Look, this is, this is what I believe. And I have to put my money where my mouth is because I make my money doing procedures, Mrs. Smith. Okay. I truly believe that the best thing I can do for you is a partial veneer gold crown in this situation. I'll tell you what. If you, after living with it for two weeks, do not like the aesthetics of it, just tell me. I will change it to a porcelain crown. I will not charge you to do it. But if I have to put my money where my mouth is, because if I value your tooth that much, and I don't want to take more away, this is the best thing for it. All I have to do to convert it to a porcelain crown is just cut off the gold and cut more tooth away. It's no big deal to me. It's not my tooth. You know what? Surprisingly, a lot of people look at you and just go, oh, okay, let me try. And I've had one person in my entire career make me change that restoration. And how long is your career? When did you, when did you get to start? I practiced it. I started, I graduated in 1981, the very beginning of the all ceramic restoration, the first castable disilicate. Dicor? Dicor. Oh my gosh. Yes. You graduated in 81. Yes. You yes. look damn good, man. I thought you were. You're... Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, and that's because I, I divorced my wife soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got I to tell Dicor story because remember, um, don't listen to manufacturers. And when I was at a school, they said, if she's beautiful, do all Dicor glass crowns and cement them with Duralon. Guess how many of those failed that I had to redo for free? I'd say about 90% of them. All of them. <laughs> then remember there was um, Targus Vectris? I yes. don't know what Targus means, and I don't know what Vectris means, but they hated each other and came apart. Mm -hmm. There was another one, Art, Art Glass, Glass by Horaeus Colzer. Mm -hmm. and, I have, Glass. And, and I have to tell you what old people do is when they see all this new stuff come out, I mean, I let all the babies, because I know everybody who hasn't stuck their tongue in a light socket will try it. <laughs> and then five years later, they're gonna get on Dental Town and tell you it was a really bad idea. So old people, They've, they've done that so many times. Um, don't be bleeding edge. Uh, uh, the most recent one was when um, 
Megagen came out with that pulverizer where you take the extracted tooth, you pulverize it, and you make your your implant. Um, you know, so you have a yeah, yeah um, tooth squeeze in art. Yeah, yeah, and it's like um, you know that just sounded so obvious and so everything. But it's like you know, I don't know if <laughs> I, I don't know if grounded up enamel and cement. And I just don't know. But I don't want to be the guy who placed one thousand implants to find out three years later that it, it wasn't a good idea. No. Hey, look, look, we love early adopters as long as it's not us. Right. right. Right, that's, right. That, that's the thing. So, so again, understand something, right? Emacs, Emacs was reintroduced disilicate in what 2005. So, 1981 Dicor failed miserably. We all hated it. I I still have a Dicor machine in my garage to remind me <laughs> not to be an early adopter. I bought one. I had set up my lab around it. Then was reintroduced as uh, Empress 2. Empress 2 went the way of the dodo. Let's see if you remember this one, Howard. He was reintroduced as Aris. Do you even remember Aris? He was around for less than a year. How do you spell that? A-R-I-S. No, I don't remember that one. Hogo's nodding. Yep. It was, Hogo remembers yeah. that Uh-huh. And quickly disappeared. Just poof. I mean, it's like, where'd you go? So then that was replaced with where we are today, Emacs. So Emacs is looking pretty good. You know, I mean, uh, 2005, I waited, I waited honestly about seven years before I jumped on the Emacs back, you know, bandwagon. So, but at least I feel comfortable with it. That said, at lab day 2019 this year in Chicago, Iva Claire was giving a lecture on guess what? how to remove cement from a deep bonded emax restoration it happens so we still have again a long way to go with understanding all interactions right you know how how old, how old are your gold crowns can i ask my, oh my god 20 years old 20 years cemented with water-based looting agents it, would have, phosphate. it was all um, zinc phosphate yeah, yeah. On, on a glass slab yeah uh -huh. they're chilled, probably saying what? Chilled, chilled glass slab what, what that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but because we understood preparation concepts it got hammered into our heads may I ask you how many how many cast restorations did you have to prep wax and cement yourself when you were a dental student on a live on a patient on a patient none yeah. none right on the lab i think on the lab mm -hmm. four or five okay. okay i don't think we had to do any really delivered on a patient wow in dental school i mean we might have that was 31 years ago <laughs> out of sight out of mind yeah, yeah. i mean that's a okay. long time ago yeah see you know when, when when i went i was like in the glory days of usc I, 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 our clinical requirement was like 30 single units you know it's a lot of single wow. units three fpds so you know just quite a bit of dentistry uh i i think most young ones would be pleased to do that much dentistry in a, in a graduate residency program you know so back in the days again the education system was different right you know it was it was just the most amazing thing in the world I could get an instructor to convince a patient they needed a class two foil on an incipient lesion. It's like the greatest thing in the world. It's, but you know, we just don't seem to have the, you know, the base of patients as well that come to dental schools. Do you, do you think a dental school is a dental school, a dental school, or do you think USC is significantly above the rest? Well, Cause, we, Cause we, there's 56 dental schools and some are private, some are public, right. some are, how old is USC? Oh, I, I have no It'd idea. It have to be a century. It's, yeah, it's it's past a, it's a century. I would yeah, say. Yeah. So, so is, is how is well, USC doing? And is it a is I, it a legend? It is. It was a legend when I left, which you know, when I graduated, that's that was like the pinnacle. You know, all things go through cycles, right? You know, dentistry. You know, our restorations are going through cycles. Education goes through a cycle. You know. Um, in the 90s, USC took a huge leap of faith and they went to problem-based learning, which is the Harvard Medical School protocol for education. So rather than sitting in didactic classes, memorizing and regurgitating information, you would be given a problem, 
you and a, and a group of other students, and you would research the solutions to those problems, create your own algorithm, which makes you a better thinker, a bit, better applier, a better listener, which is perfect if you're going to be a physician. So this education system needed a facilitator who didn't have to be a physician or a dentist that would guide these students in their journey of learning. And if they were doing a good job, they'd come on, yes, good, good job. If they're going in the wrong direction, they'd whistle them back, you know, come back this way. So it proved really effective, incredibly effective in, in creating an empathetic physician, well-balanced, well, well well-knowledged physician. So USC implemented the problem-based, this is very simplified, by the way, really simplified. USC implemented problem-based learning in the med school. And guess what happened? For the first time in the history of the med school, it was profitable because the facilitators didn't need to, need to be physicians. So they implemented in the pharmacy school. And guess what happened? For the first time in the history of the pharmacy school, it was profitable. So what was the next logical move for the regents? Do it to the dental school. Hal Slavkin, you know, what, just one of, one of you know, the most incredible deans with a great mind and, you know, once was the head of the NIH, was tasked with putting, implementing problem-based learning at USC Dental School, and unfortunately, it failed miserably. But by the time they got a full four years of classes through the, the dental school, they changed the physical facility, they changed the curriculum so much, they changed the instructors that we went from being one of the top dental schools in the country to just a dental school. And I think what's happening to a lot of dental schools, they're having the same problem. There's no one best right now because there's just too much information to teach now than when you and I were students. I mean, what did we have to know when we were, when we were in dental school? How to, how to do an amalgam? A, uh, uh, enamel etching barely came into being. You know, we just played with chemical composites and we had to know how to do a casting. I mean, that's pretty, where were implants? The implants didn't occur till what, three years after I graduated. So that's the, that's the problem. We've got too much information and not enough time and dental schools are still struggling with that balance. You, um, every time you do a hands-on course over the shoulder, mm -hmm. it's sold out in, a, in an instant. Pretty much. What, what, what are you, talk, talk about your over the shoulders. And oh, they're, hand, they're more hands-on. So, um, you know, I'd been doing those for quite a while on my own. Where, then, where do you do those at? Well, I did those on my own in, in, in uh, Los Angeles, and then I got tired of doing them because they're a tremendous amount of work. And then another mentor influencer that I met through Dental Town, Mike Melkers, you know, lit a fire under my ass and said, you know what? I do this. Let's do it together. And so we've been doing those together, and we, we take the show on the road. We've uh, done one in Los Angeles. Our second one in Denver is coming up next month. Uh, we have one scheduled next the next year um, in uh, Chicago, and basically, Mike and I bring our cake, a couple of our cases to the participants, and they are forced to go through the thought process, the workup, the treatment planning, so that they have a roadmap on how we would address a full comprehensive case. You know, do, going back to the occlusion thing of learning, learning where it was critical in the time of your career, once you understand dentistry in and of itself, once you have the confidence to do onesie, twosie crowns, right? Big cases really are not that much harder, but where they're harder is planning them so that you can execute them like onesie, twosies. So that's where you know we come in. We, we take these cases that look just like insurmountable at their face but when you start breaking it out and working it up on your own then you get it hopefully the light bulb goes on and so that's the goal of these hands-on courses michael melker is an amazing man love that guy mm -hmm. shout out to him and his wife and um, they left spokane and now they're on the east coast right right so they were on west coast with you and yeah now they're, mm -hmm. now they're east coast yep um one of the problems, um, she's young, she's out of school, she's been doing it two or three years. It's just a six year molar, it's broken down. Right, the money tooth. The money tooth. Yeah. But it's just severely worn down dentition. Mm -hmm. we, how does she supposed to think about, do I just treat this one tooth and keep it in the severely worn dentition? Where do you, where do you cross the line and say, there is yes. When when is that tipping point going to occur? Yeah, where, where, okay. where is that tipping point? We we talked about treatment planning front to back 
back to front. And my, my real belief is that tipping point occurs when the front teeth can no longer do what they were designed to do. And that's to reduce the bite forces, the parafunctional forces that are occurring on the back tooth. Okay, And we can evaluate that quite easily by looking at the dentition. We can do it quite easily by taking mounted casts. And once they hit that tipping point, you need to move forward. Now, when is that going to happen in a worn dentition? I don't know. But I'm also going to say something else. One of the problems with a worn dentition is the patient's biggest complaint isn't their worn molar, is it? The biggest complaint is they wore their front teeth down and they don't show them. So the strategy is, is if you're going to rejuvenate a worn dentition, you're going to have to lengthen their front teeth. To, in order to lengthen their front teeth without having the same parafunctional attack angle that wore out their teeth in the first place, now this is where we have to start getting into opening the vertical dimension of occlusion. So that decision tr point comes when you've lost and you're about to lose all the information that the front teeth give you. And that's the simplest way I can put it. That's the simplest way you can put it. Yeah. I want to hear the most complicated. Oh, well, you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, because that is a, um, it, it's scary because now she has to do, mm -hmm. you know, full arch dentistry. Right, right. And and sometimes you can do a partial arch. You know, sometimes, you know, John Nosti, another townie that I, I just consider a huge mentor and influencer. You know, John and I reach out. I reach out to John all the time and have questions for the guy. I mean, the, you know, you, 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 Howard, the gift that you brought to this profession just astounds me that I can count probably Artie Volker, who's sitting over there laughing. Artie Volker. Another, another huge influencer, you know. <laughs> Artie, do you have a question for him? Hogo, do you have a question? Artie, come on. You have to ask one question on this podcast. Then, Hogo, you have to ask the next question. <laughs> Artie, come back here. Artie was one of the first podcasters I ever did. I Really? Yeah. He was lecturing. No, 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 sit, no. Don't get me. No. Yeah. He's, uh, he was lecturing in, uh, in, in New York City. Uh -huh. And I nabbed him right off the stage and said, sit down. I'm podcasting you. And I think he said, what is a podcast? Pretty was much. Pretty much. So, what, what's your what, what's your question for Lane? Yeah, that, very very simple. You know, thank you. You've influenced so many townies, so many people throughout the years. What keeps you fresh? Is it just that relaying information? Because I mean, you know, you've said I'm listening to you guys lurking as I usually do on Dental Town over there. Being a lurker, this is my historical uh, uh, history with with Lane. Is I've always lurked his posts and just. Yeah try to soak up as much as I can. How do you stay motivated? Like, you know, you keep contributing and you're still running high on energy. I'm just curious, what keeps you going? Well, uh, that's easy, Artie. It's, it's like you. It's, it, you know what? The, the more we invest, right, in, in our abilities, the more we love what we do. It's, it's such a simple formula, you know, getting people excited about doing quality dentistry, taking it to the next level. You know, it's like, just just what was your most recent post uh, using using um, uh, uh, printed uh, models to help you guide your direct work? I mean, just the fact that, look, I want another tool in the toolbox. Doesn't that make what we do so much more fun and so exciting? I'm sure it's pushing the envelope. Exactly. But I mean, you know, you also take you don't have to do this. I'll tell you a story about, about Lane when I went to go visit him in Beverly Hills. You know, he came and he made time for me. And I said, you know, I just want to say hi. That's all I wanted to do, just to say hello. And he says, look, Artie, we'll go. Let's talk a little bit. But I have somebody in the chair. And he took the time just to see, you know, to, to make people feel welcome. And as a dentist who was following you for years and years, like that was just, you know, it, it's that extra thing. It's like, I don't mean to say I'm a fanboy, but, you know, I'm a big fanboy. I don't make a secret of it. I love both of you guys. And just to have you take the time to, to inspire I'm like that's 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 incredible. So right. thank you for that, and thank you for that. Well, thank you, Artie. And I'm going to jump off. Yeah, and 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 to Artie's point, like attracts like, right? This is right. You've you've created a world of guys who are like minded. That it's like go, damn, why didn't I think of that? You know that I, I'm going to implement that in my next case, and you get excited about the littlest thing. Oh, well, you got to come ask a question. I know this is of a huge oh, I, but 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 I don't like Hogo. <laughs> <laughs> I get this everywhere. I get this everywhere. 
you know, there's so many things I wouldn't ask you because just you, you, what, what watch am I wearing? That's you, a, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> what watch are you wearing? Uh, a very nice watch, uh, vintage. Yeah, um, you are probably the number one clinical person on Dental Time Message Board that people ask for advice from. Well, that's that's only because Chaslin, you know, is like being really lazy, not coming on very much anymore. Well, no comment. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um. I'm going to criticize you. No, I'm not. I, I have a question about what you said earlier about mm. milling yes. being a th less accurate because of the internal surface. Correct. And you said, but the margins are fine. So what? why wouldn't you just take a, a get, get it milled, take a bird, d d d scratch out the inside except for the margin, mm -hmm. and then have it sit down perfectly? No, it's the other way around. It's it's too loose internally. Why? But if you have risk, but it, isn't resistance more important than retention? No. <laughs> it's a combined effort of both resistance, retention, and it turns out the film thickness of our looting agents is right. also a critical part of the equation. So if a restoration is over milled internally, right. you drop the you drop the shear strength of our looting agents significantly. Okay. So that's a huge, you know part of the total yeah. picture so i always i just found on this and there's no scientific study that if i had no resistance the crown came off of course if i had no retention the crown came off no the crown if i and i bonded it of course mm. yeah it stayed on but yes. resistance was always more important to me than retention yes you're absolutely right you're absolutely right so i, but, I was wondering no that's what was throwing me off when i heard you say that earlier well i'll tell you what come watch what i have to say tomorrow Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, I didn't think but so, but thanks. It will, but we are filming it, and it will be on the downtown CE in a couple months, so hang on for that, okay? But I want to I wanted go back to another thing. Um, kudos to Hogo, because yeah, my biggest nothing. mistake on Dental Town was letting it be a Wild West libertarian. I thought it, it's insulting for me to edit your post or tell you what you can't say. I just did not understand the toxic troller of the time. And, and then 10 years later, it's common knowledge that in school there's bullies, there's mm -hmm. bullying, and all the schools are looking for it and everybody's looking for it. But when we started Dental Town in 98, bullying wasn't even a concept. I mean, yeah. or I would, but you were the one who kept telling us for years this has got to change well, you, gave me, you gave me the permission to do that yeah. so kudos to you for like for saying yes that's the direction we want to go i mean i you know and, I, then, I, and, then, and then when you find great people you get out of their way exactly. i mean do i ever micromanage or overrule no, you do not things? you do not mm -hmm. and i appreciate that yeah, yeah. Appreciate now when we that. play nice we we learn more I yes mean, you know we could we could I, I like a hearty disagreement you know i really do well, what's funny is I think almost of every person we've ever banned on Dental Town uh, is one of my friends. I mean, I actually, I, my, I, 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 I swear to tell you, never come and say, "Why did you ban him for?" Or if you do, I say, I explain why. You go, yeah, good move. You know, and, and you know what? This is some something wrong with my personality because we have we've had to fire a patient about every five years because he's over the top, crazy, nuts. Us, half of them were my drinking friends. <laughs> and we, we'd be at, we, we'd be at the seven o'clock deal. And one of them, I, I shouldn't even say his name, but uh, anyway, uh, John. And I mean, he's like one of my favorite friends in the world. But when he comes in the dental office, he he uses, you know, over the top language because he's scared. He doesn't like them. But anyway, long story short, my just my just staff said, you know, we just we just can't stand him. So I had to call him up and I said, I love you. I'll, I'll go have a beer the other night, but you can't come in here anymore because they all hate you. That's <laughs> the same go. thing with Dental Town. Some of these people post stuff that I think is hilarious, but you delete, and it's like I get it, I get it. It's yeah. toxic, and some people, I don't, um, some people it doesn't bother some people. But thanks for changing oh, thank the entire you. culture of uh, of Dental Town. And, and now and the president of the of the Academy of General Dentistry, are you not the president of the Academy? You got to come over here and ask a question. <laughs> come on, you're 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 the president of the most oh, by, continued by, by, education. By the way, the only reason I'm here today is because of that man Hogo. Yeah. yeah. So this is the president of the Academy of General Dentistry. And I just want to say one thing that in my journey the but looking back of all the decisions I made, the best decision I ever made was to get my fellowship in the AGD, mm -hmm. and the reason Always I learning. and and then my master's in the AGD because what I learned as a little twenty four year old kid is that when I went to those courses, the people had their FAGD, they were they were at another level 
of the non ones. And, and, and I said, uh, how did you get like that? And they go, well, I took 500 hours of CE and I did all stuff, but that's what that I, I cut my teeth getting my right. FAGD. And, and the other thing is we had a study and I know you guys are looking for, it, and we had it on dental town, but there was a big time major consultant and I forgot who it was, but he did he, uh, uh, just all of his dental CPA clients of uh, a DDS degree versus an FAGD versus an MAGD mm -hmm. and the net income just went straight up. Sure. You just can't take 150 hours of CE a year and not learn Correct. something. Well, we're going full circle here, Howard, right? Passions, right? Artie, passion, passion. It raises the bar, raises your ability. And guess what happens? Patients pick up on it. Patients want that. Patients refer their friends, I want that to you. I mean, this is just the coolest self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Education. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just want to echo uh, what Howard said earlier. You know, it's a town. Dental Town is, is a community. And there's enough room in the sandbox for everybody to play. And as a specialist, I'm sure you appreciate generalists to do certain procedures and, and, and certain things. And as well to refer to you those things that are outside their scope or outside what they feel comfortable doing. There's too many people out there that protect their specialties and don't want general dentists to do anything that should be in their specialty. It's like the whole discussion about implants. It's a root, so endodontists should be doing it. <laughs> it's surgery, so the surgeons are in it. It's in the gums, so the periodontists think they're the experts. Well, and it's prosthetically driven, so the prosthodontics thinks, prosthodontist thinks that they should be doing it. So who is who should be doing it? Well, yeah. first and foremost, you know, I, I've said this on Dental well, Town. You haven't even oh, told him you're yeah. a prosthodontist. No, I'm not a prosthodontist. <laughs> I'm a generalist. I started a prosthodontic residency, and this is why I, I, I'm into, you know, all the things that, that poor prosthodontist residents have to go through, right? Literature review, case review. Uh, I never made past my first year because I was offered the most incredible mentorship opportunity of a lifetime. And I went to my director and said, so and so just offered me a position in his practice. And he goes, later. I go, what do you mean later? Am I not that good? He goes, no, I want you as a resident, but I can't give you what he's going to give you. And so. And who no, is that? Uh, Albert Solnit, who is one of the premier doctors in occlusion, um, has wrote one of the ultimate textbooks on occlusal correction. Yeah, just just a tremendous opportunity. And you know, um, he just just this is this talk about a man whose passion was dentistry. Both his sons are world respected dentists as well. His youngest son Gary is a prosthodontist in Beverly Hills hugely successful big time lecture and his other son jay went the endo route he's an endodontist at beverly hills so you know there's a sonnet legacy so and so i i, 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 I did my own horn my boy just got his ankle bracelet taken off the other day and can now <laughs> fly again but anyway continue. I, I hope you're an agent you member <laughs> yeah. if not i have a membership application All right, for you I, I will i will uh just bring it to me right after this. But I, I, but I, say, I gotta jump in one second. Yeah. Let's let Absolutely, go. please. I became an ADA, AGD member <laughs> in 1981. I have never been a member of the ADA. How's that? I like that. The fact that you're an AGD member, you know, we're very proud of that. And, and I've and never been a member of the ADA, never. I, I, did, I did not know that. Yep. Wow. Ah. He's a rebel with a cause. There you go. Always, always a rebel. But I think right? we all can agree on one thing is that when, when you look at um, success, I mean, you don't measure success in dollars and cents on it. It's do they have a fun and rewarding and fulfilling career. Right. So what lines up with a long, rewarding, fulfilling career? The obvious most low hanging fruit is a hundred hours of CE a year. Right. Those guys always stayed in the game. They always loved it. Mm -hmm. And you talk about burnout. Well, yeah, they haven't learned anything for five years. I mean, I mean, you and, and, and even if you're going to a CE course on occlusion and you were suffering burnout, well, what better five guys at dinner to That's talk right. about burnout? Right. I, I always thought it was funny that half the course I ever went to, half the stuff I learned was just from the, the group, mm -hmm. had right. nothing to do with the, the lecture. Right. Yeah, no, that's like, and that's what Dental Town is. I mean, you know, Artie and I chat offline all the time, you know? I, 
that, that hogo guy you know i i, I even try i even talked to him a little bit about uh some laminar techniques that i i tried didn't work at all in my hands but i enjoyed trying it and i you know i figured with enough practice it really made a lot of sense but you know it, it's it's the guys it's it's the old saying right like attracts like well, you know and, and, and the other thing you said right is when you're in a group together Mm -hmm. It's good to know that the same shit happens in everybody's practice. Yep. Then you feel like, you know what? It's not something I'm doing wrong or I'm incompetent. It's sometimes they things just don't work out. Right. And maybe you learn from somebody. It's just, oh, you know what? You have to use a thinner layer of cement. You have to use a different material or whatever it may be that the two don't mix and match, like your last article that you, you were talking about. So... You know, these are the small things that you pick up on that will literally change your life right. and your practice. So, so now I got to get to the dentistry uncensored part, the politically sure. incorrect stuff that people don't want to talk about. She's been out of school three or four years. Mm -hmm. She thinks in order to be a good dentist like you, that she needs to spend $150,000 on a CAD CAM machine. You want to know something? True or false? False. Um, patients are not impressed by technology. They're not. They're impressed with you, period. Are you honest? You know, do you take the time to listen? Do you not hurt them? These are the critical things patients are looking for. God, I still shoot film in my in my office. You know, I've got a dip tank for God's sakes. I mean, I have a processor, but I still shoot film. Uh, I have no modern technology whatsoever. Well, okay, I have a three shape scanner. I, I do take impressions. I scan my I scan my models, but from what the patient sees, I have nothing new. Okay. I don't think technology is necessary. And in fact, you know what's interesting? There was a survey, interesting survey, just published this year by Inside Dentistry. Do you know how many of us actually use digital capture for Crown and Bridge? How many? 17%. That's a, you know, that's minimal, right? That's nothing. So. And how many do you think you use CAD CAM? Uh, 25. 25. 25. And that market, that number hasn't changed very much at all. Yeah. Yeah. You mean in-house CAD CAM? Yeah. Yeah. Chair side milling. Chair side milling. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you were talking, when Hogo asked you about the internal fit, you mm -hmm. know, cast ground, mm -hmm. um, that, that was a reduction milling where you started right. the block, yes. reduced down. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing the opposite. They're printing. Right. Does any of that excite you? Uh, personally, not yet. Not yet. So it's still bleeding edge. Yeah, it's it's still. Um, you know what? It, it's going to be here. It's probably not going to be here in my career lifetime, but it's definitely going to be here. And so what? So what is your what is your wheelhouse? What are you mostly doing in your practice? Is it mostly Crown and Bridge? It's all Crown and Bridge. It's all Crown and yeah. Bridge. Mm -hmm. And what percent of it is uh, gold versus other? Ah, uh, well, gold. You know, if you what because you know Crown and Bridge. Sometimes I told you my operative numbers, but in terms of uh, my full numbers, I would say a good twenty percent of my of my practice is still gold. Is gold and and what is the other eighty percent? Uh it's it's still metal ceramic and all ceramic. So say all ceramic. Again. It's metal ceramic plus all ceramic. So all ceramic is beginning to increase in numbers. You know the the ability to do a partial veneer restoration tooth colored restoration on a bicuspid and rather than cut the whole thing down into a nub for a metal ceramic crown is a game changer you know just to preserve tooth you know one of the the interesting things about the evolution of a dentist or at least me as a dentist the the most humbling moment came you know when i realized that my best work failed I mean, that is like the most humbling moment in your professional career, that you can do the best technical work possible and it still fails. And it, 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 that, it made me search out and start thinking about some of what Bob Barkley taught, right? And, and one of the most powerful statements he made, right, is our job is to help our patients get worse at the slowest rate possible. So when you asked me about when do, when do I... How long do I watch a wear patient before I do a reconstruction? Part of what you have to ask yourself in the big picture is, well, if they wore out their own dentition, what's going to keep them from wearing out what I do? And how old is this patient? You know, am I so quick to do a rehab on somebody in their 40s? When I graduated from dental school, damn straight I wanted one. 
I'd do it all the time. Today, I'd be horrified if I did it. So, you know, that's kind of kind of where you know I've evolved to. So my dentistry has become a lot more conservative. It really has. You know, I remember one time um, I met a 92 year old dentist in St. Joe, Missouri, and his name was George Rui. And his son, George Rui Jr. was a dentist, and his son, George Rui III, was a dentist. And I asked this 92-year-old guy, I said, uh, which teeth last the longest? And he said, the one the dentist never touched. Exactly. <laughs> I was thinking he was going to say, is it central? Which one is it? The one you never touch. That's right. And and when we touch the teeth and reduce it, we commit it to a life of retirement. Right. Dentistry begats dentistry begats dentistry. And the, dirt, and the sad part is, and I see this in my community, it drives me nuts, that I see 20-somethings that want veneers. And I say, no, just not going to do it. You know, you can go get ortho, you can get bleaching, we can reshape, but you're not going to do veneers. Well, why not? I, I Dr. So-and-so I consulted with and Dr. So-and-so, and they said they'll start tomorrow. I said, well, did they also tell you how long they're going to last? Well, they're going to last forever, aren't they? Uh, no. They go, well, how long will they last? I said, well, a really, really good set of veneers might last you 20 years. How? Let's see, you'll be 40 then. Well, the next set will only last half as long as the first set. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. So let's see, that takes you to 50. And this third set are probably going to be crowns, so we're going to cut down your teeth to little stubs. You may get another 10 years before one or two snaps off. By the way, did you see that Instagram post of Demi Moore that because she's had her front teeth veneered so many times, she snapped off her two front teeth? I did not see oh, that. Oh, yeah. And so patients- Did most you post of, that on Dental Time? No, I didn't know. No, but it's, it's out there in, in our community, in Beverly Hills, you know, because everyone knows her. And people go- that's because she had veneers done and yeah. i go yep <laughs> multiple times so 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 how do you combat that because dentists aren't dated you i mean you still have dentists that believe that their composites last as long as amalgams mm -hmm. yeah whenever i see big studies that it, the amalgams last twice as long as composites and you you have big footprints in dentistry saying that their veneers are permanent mm -hmm. And, and then if you say, no, they only last 20 years, then they're like, well, maybe yours only lasts right. 20 years. Well, I, my, my but, response but is I'm, how, I'm not that good. <laughs> but how do, you, how do you counteract data-driven? Whose data? And, and right, that, that's, right, that's right. always the thing. You know, it's like anything, right? And, and, when, and this is what we talked about. Who do, what do patients really want from you? They want honesty. Right. And, and the most honest answer you can give them is that nothing we do is as good as your own tooth. Period. I, I don't know how, you know, everything in anything, original equipment is usually the best, unless it's a, a lemon right from the get go. But people respect that attitude. They really and truly do. Yeah. And, and I'm, and kudos to you and kudos to me for turning down so many cosmetic mm -hmm. cases where I just told the kids, look, if you're my daughter, you're going to get braces mm -hmm. and bleaching. And guess what? Honestly, you, you know, some will be boneheads and, and do what they want to do, but most will listen, you know, especially if they drag their parents in who are paying for this. So I want to ask you another question. Um, when I ask Dennis, why are you stressed out? Why are you burned out? And so a lot of times it's managing patients. Mm -hmm. And so that good old boy in Parsons, Kansas, his patients are nearly as a pain in the butt as yours and Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what it, what advice would you give to kids? Um, what, what would you call them? High maintenance patients? Right. Um, I mean, Beverly Hills, I mean, that's a lot harder person to handle than a corn farmer from Iowa. So how do, how do you, <laughs> how do you handle these big egos major well probably because i have a bigger ego than most of them but <laughs> <laughs> no it also it all seriousness you know uh boy it, it's it's the old it's the old saying right the, unfortunately this is our own creation we get paid for procedures right we don't get paid for degrees of difficulties and, and that's that's our own fault and so one of the, the key things is is you have to always ask yourself you know is the juice going to be worth the squeeze you know am i really going to enjoy doing this case is this case going to cause me an ulcer in my stomach lining and if it is you know can i charge enough to rationalize this so i'll be happy and so when you go back to what you asked me quickly jumping into cases 
you know, comprehensive aesthetic cases. I ain't quick to jump into any of them. I need to get to know the patient. You know, you've seen me jokingly refer to some of these cases and patients in dental town. Well, put them in the perio penalty box first, you know, see how they do with their, their recalls, you know, are they behaving? Show me what you're about, you know, lose them in repositioning, whatever you want to call it, but just don't start right away. You know what? They'll either get really frustrated and their true persona may show, uh, or they will go, wow, no one's ever done this. You know, I really like the, you know, listen carefully, you know, learn, learn how to communicate by listening. But until you get to know patients, uh, and I bet, you know, Artie's the same way, you know, that he really wants to make sure he knows his patient before he commits them to any kind of dentist, cosmetic dentistry, be it adhesive or, uh, you know, purely direct bonding or having to prepare teeth. Yeah. So, um, my guy, I can't believe the hour went by. We already did an hour. Artie, what question was I not smart enough to ask? Did I get them all? Did you? Was, was there any anything that you wished I, I would have talked about, or any subject I didn't bring up? Or no, we went we went around the block pretty good there. I think. No. Yeah. Um. Well, really, already you guys. <laughs> I mean, um, Dental Town was nothing without you guys. I mean, it was just. Uh, I mean, you guys are what made Dental Town. And um, you, um, well, like, you still need a vision. You, you know, you you'll still you still need somebody in charge who's got a passion. So, but what you know what I love about you the most is mm-hmm. sometimes you would just post this like, like this little drawing that was like two lines, <laughs> but it completely. I mean, you're just a master educator. You take the very complex and you make it very simple. And some of the most profound things that you did on me, I bet you made that slide in two minutes. I mean, it'd be, you know, just a little deal. And you could just tell what we weren't seeing. Right. And then you'd make a little image and you'd see it. You know what I mean? So kudos to you. I mean, the the doctor comes from the Latin word docere, meaning to teach. Mm-hmm. And my God, if there's a doctor, it should be you. Yeah, you know, I, the, that's, that's the ultimate compliment. Thank you, my friend. Enjoyed thank it. Thank you. 